Tonight, we are looking at a series, The Things That Are Most Surely Believed Amongst Us. Luke chapter 1, from verse 1 to verse 3. And so we've been examining the things most surely believed. He said, for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed amongst us. Verse 2. So let's change the pattern on the, on the, on the laptop. It needs to speak in tongues for some time. He said, even as they were delivered, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Verse 3. He said, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding in all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. So, I showed you that day, this is a transition between four generations. The apostles of Jesus that learned from him, who are the ministers of the word, they received from Christ, and then they communicated it to Dr. Luke, and Dr. Luke said he, he has had perfect understanding, so he was communicating it to Theophilus. So I said, the way heritage is transferred is through instructions. Those who receive it, if they understand it, they now communicate it to the next generation. And that's what Luke was doing here. And I told you, in the Christian faith, there are things that are most surely believed. These are the things we cannot do without. And we've taken time to deal with these things one after the other. The first thing we dealt with is the doctrine of God. And we looked at the biblical concept of the person of God and everything that his person and his operation entails. In fact, we summarized that when we looked at the mystery of the Godhead. When we were done with that, we migrated to looking at the doctrine of Christ. And um, we did a part of the doctrine of Christ because the second part of that doctrine is intertwined with the doctrine of salvation. So in order not to repeat or re overemphasize certain things, we decided to reserve it to deal with it when we are dealing with the doctrine of salvation. And when we looked at the doctrine of Christ, number one, we looked at his humanity, and then we looked at his deity, and then we looked at the hypostatic nature that is the coexistence between his human nature and his divine nature. When we were done doing that, we now went further to look at his ministry or his administrative responsibility. And then we considered four aspects of that from his offices. So we looked at Jesus as God the Son, co-equal with the Father and co-equal with the Spirit eternally. And then we looked at Jesus as the Son of God. And we also looked at Jesus as the Son of Man. And then we looked at Jesus as the Christ. And we said for you to understand and appreciate his essence in his full sense, you have to know him in these four offices. So we looked at that. We were supposed to look at his ministry, which entails the incarnation, the, the atonement, and the mediatorship responsibility. But we only touched the incarnation because the atonement and the mediatorship responsibility of Jesus, which is a cardinal aspect of his ministry, is also included in the doctrine of salvation. So when we are looking at the doctrine of salvation, we will deal with that in depth. So we stopped at the incarnation and then summarized the doctrine of Christ. So in dealing with the doctrine of Christ, we looked at his person, and in his person we saw his humanity and his deity, and then we looked at his, at his offices, and in his offices we looked at him as God the Son, Son of God, Son of Man, and Christ, and then we looked at a part of his ministry, which is his incarnation, and we stopped there. Tonight we are going to begin with the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We will revisit the doctrine of Christ when we are dealing with salvation. Hallelujah. And so, we are going to look at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit tonight, and there are five major things we'll consider in order to exhaust this subject. The first thing we'll consider is the person of the Holy Spirit, and then we'll consider the deity of the Holy Spirit, then we'll consider the ministry of the Holy Spirit, then we'll consider the symbols of the Holy Spirit, and finally, we'll consider the names of the Holy Spirit. All of these give us dimensions of revelations concerning that being called the Holy Spirit. We'll look at his person, his deity, 
his ministry, the symbols that represent his manifestation and operations, and then his names. So let's begin with the person of the Holy Spirit. It's important to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. I'm, I'm going to try to, uh, to read scriptures because when you are teaching on the Holy Spirit, it's very easy to lose the service. The atmosphere becomes volatile. The last time I did this teaching, I broke it into three parts and there was no one we were able to finish. But today, I will teach it like a theologian. Praise God. <laughs> so we we'll look at the, the person of the Holy Ghost. And I said it's important to look at the Holy Ghost as a person. Because there are many who think he's a force. There are many who think he's a phenomenon. There are many who think he's just an experience. They don't know him as a person. And because they don't know him as a person, they cannot worship him correctly. They cannot relate with him correctly. And they cannot receive all that he has to offer. If you think the Holy Ghost is a wind... The God dimension of the Holy Ghost will not be in your consciousness. And so you will not relate with him as God. And because you don't relate with him as God, the things of God that he brings to your ecosystem, you will not enjoy it. This is why it's important to see the Holy Spirit as a person. But of course, before you look at him as a person, you need to understand primarily that he is God. Praise God. And I'm going to deal with that exhaustively when I look at the deity of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Ghost, like I shared with you, is the third person of the Godhead. And what that means is that he is co-equal with the Father and the Son. He is co-eternal with the Father and the Son. And he is co-existent with the Father and the Son. And you remember, when we were looking at the doctrine of the Godhead, we said the clearest explanation of that doctrine is derived from our understanding of nature. Because that's what the Bible teaches. In Romans 1 verse 20, he said, the secrets of God, even the deepest things about his power and his Godhead is manifested in nature. And we picked water as an illustration to explain this concept. And we said water essentially is H2O, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen. However, existentially, water is either liquid or solid or gas because it's a divine principle. Anything God creates and anything that must exist will have two dimensions. The first dimension is the essence of that being and the second dimension is the existential essence of that being. So water is a combination of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, ratio of two is to one. But in existence, you cannot interact with it in that elementary form. You either relate with it as liquid you relate with it as solid or you relate with it as gas. Now, we said solid is not liquid and liquid is not gas. Steam is different from water and water is different from ice block in their physical properties. That is their existential properties. But in their chemical properties, which is their essential properties, they are both, they are all the same. In like manner, the father is not the son. The son is not the spirit. However, both the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is one being and is God. So, God is one, manifesting in three persons. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. So, He is co-equal with the Father. Just as ice is equal with water in every respect, and water is equal with steam in every respect, the Holy Ghost is equal with the Son in every respect. Jesus is not greater than the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Ghost is equal with the Father in every respect. The Father is not greater than the Holy Spirit. We also went further to say, just as ice did not exist before water, and water did not exist before steam, they all existed at the same time, but manifesting at different temperature, so also the Father is not older than the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not older than the Son. Are you following this? So, co-equality and co-eternality is the secret that makes them one, although in different manifestations. And then we went further to say, there will never be a time when water will exist and ice will not exist. There will never be a time when ice will exist and liquid will not exist. If you are looking at steam, change the temperature, it will turn to water. Change the temperature, it will talk to, turn to ice. So everywhere there is steam, there is also water. There is also ice block. So they coexist. One cannot exist apart from the other. 
in like manner, we said the Holy Spirit, or we are saying the Holy Spirit is coexistent with the Son and coexistent with the Father. So, in every respect, the Holy Spirit is God and is equal with the Father and the Son. Now, having explained this, let's look at the Holy Ghost as a person. Because God is not air. God is not water. God is not fire. God is a person. And I told you when I was dealing with the subject of God that there are five attributes that qualify any being to be a person. Number one attribute I said, for any being to be a person, it must have consciousness. A stone is not a person. It doesn't have consciousness. So the first quality that makes a being a person is the quality of consciousness. The second quality that makes a being a person is that every person must have a mind or rationality. If you don't have a mind, you can't be a person. The third quality that makes a being a person is that that being must have a will or autonomy. If you don't have a will, you can't be a person. The fourth quality that makes a being a person is that every being that is a person must have emotion. If you don't have emotion, you are not a person. And then finally, the fifth quality that makes a being a person is self-identity and continuity. Every being that is a person must have identity. If you don't have self-identity, you are not a person. Your consciousness is your perceptibility. That's how you are able to know things. And your consciousness is your faculty that makes it possible for you to interact with your environment. So every person has the capacity to perceive and to interact with the environment. Your mind is what gives you the ability to reason. That's why it's your rational component. Your will is what gives you the ability to make choices. Your emotion is what gives you the ability to appreciate reality. Either through empathy or compassion or love or joy or happiness. If you don't have emotion, you cannot appreciate reality. And your self-identity is what makes you recognize your worth. So every being that is a person possesses these five qualities. And when you look at the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost possesses these five, these five qualities. So the first parameter that makes us know that the Holy Ghost is a person is that he possesses these five qualities. Number one, let's look at consciousness. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 and 1 Corinthians 2.10. These two scriptures reveal to us that the Holy Ghost has consciousness. Can we project the scriptures? The Spirit himself. Help us, help us, help us. What's happening with this? I want to follow this so that I won't go too far. Romans 8 verse 16. Not 26. And then 1 Corinthians 2.10. I really... It said the Spirit Himself, this is Old King James, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. So you see that the being has consciousness. Consciousness enough to tell us and to quicken in us that we are God's children. So it is on the strength of his consciousness that he can tell us and bring us also to consciousness that we are God's children. 1 Corinthians 2.10, you will see the activity of consciousness also going on in the Holy Spirit. He said, but God had revealed these things to us. Okay, go start from verse 9 so that it makes sense. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ears heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Next verse. He said, But God had revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searched all things, the deep things of God. So the things we are not conscious of, the way God brings us into consciousness of those things is by the agency of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Ghost is not conscious, he can't bring you into consciousness. Have you seen a dead man waking another dead man? You must be awake to wake somebody from sleep. If I tap you, say, wake up, wake up, it's because I'm already awake. I can't be sleeping and waking you up. That would be a disease. It doesn't work that way. So the reason the Holy Ghost brings us into consciousness 
that we are God's children and brings us into consciousness of the things God has made available to us is because himself possesses self-consciousness. Number two, the Holy Ghost has a will. 1 Corinthians 2, 11. You will see that. 1 Corinthians 2, 11. It says, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man that is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. So you see that the Holy Ghost has a mind. He knows the things of God. He is able to perceive the things of God, understand the things of God, and interact with the things of God cognitively. So the Holy Ghost has what? A mind. Have you seen that he has a consciousness and he also has a mind? If he doesn't have a mind, there's no way he can know. The Holy Ghost is able to know because he possesses a mind. The Holy Ghost also possesses a will. John 16, 13. I have many things to tell you. He said, but you cannot receive it. How be it when the spirit of truth is come? Okay. How be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truths. And he shall not speak of himself, but, he, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you all things. Are you seeing that everything he's doing here is according to his will? He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. But the things that he has heard is what he will show you. And he will lead 